anyway, today this is the name tag Sunday. So if you don't mind, my name is Jong Ho, and uh, it'll be great. I can see your name too. Let's worship. Without your love, slave to the darkness, if he was for the cross, you have won me with your kindness, chase me.
God, you are so holy. Go ahead, give him the praise. God, you are so holy. There is no one like you. There is no one beside you. God, this song is so simple. And it just gives all the glory and the honor and the praise to you, God. That's why we're singing this song this morning. God, that's why we're here this morning. It's for you. So God, continue to be with us as we hear from Jake this morning. Continue to open our hearts and transform us. Renew our minds to be more like you. God, change our plans, change our perspectives, whatever it takes, God. We want to be more like you because you are the only one that's holy. And all good things come from you. God, we love you and we give you all the glory and the praise. Amen. Good morning, Emmanuel. How are you today? We are so excited that you're here with us this morning. I have a couple announcements for you, but while you hear those, you can pull out your phone and check in on the Church Center app to let us know that you're here with us. The first thing we want to celebrate this week is the last week we were able to baptize 30 people across our three Easter services. We are just blown away with the way that God is moving in this church, and we just want you guys to know about it and to celebrate that with us, the life change that is happening here at Emmanuel. We are beyond excited about that, and we're excited for the things that God has in store this upcoming year. We wanted to highlight ways that you can serve here at Emmanuel. Now, if you've been here a while, you know that Four of our key pillars here are worship, growth, connection, and service. And so we wanted to let you guys know how you are able to get involved here. If you'd like, you can, while you're checking in this morning, go on your Church Center app, scroll down until you see volunteer, click that button, and it'll take you to a form where you can check out the different volunteer positions that we have here on Sunday mornings and beyond. And you can click and get more information or sign up there if you would like. There are several different teams that we have here, like the worship team, the tech team, the greeting team, and many more that really need your help. And really, a lot of what we do relies on our key volunteers that we have every coming back every Sunday. So if you would like to get involved, you can go there or you can go on our website and you can find where it says volunteer and that'll take you to our volunteer page where it'll lead you to that form where you can sign up. This Thursday, April 20th at 7 p.m., we are having our annual vision meeting on Zoom. Now, the annual vision meeting is a time for our congregation like you to come and meet the staff a little bit, ask questions if you'd like, but it's really to hear our vision about where we've been for the past year, reflect on how we've grown, and just looking to the future and seeing what is coming up for Emmanuel. So if that is something you are intrigued by, uh, look out in your email this week. It should be coming tomorrow, an email from our office with the Zoom link to join us there this Thursday at 7 p.m. We are beyond excited this upcoming summer. We are holding the IF gathering for women here at Emmanuel. If you don't know what this is, this is a two-day gathering where women will come. They'll remind each other and themselves that God is who they need and who will provide. Registration is $50 and that includes the evening on Friday, June 2nd, and then the morning to the end of the afternoon on June 3rd. This will include also snacks, a light breakfast, and lunch on Saturday. We are excited for that coming up, and if that is something that sounds good to you, then you can go ahead and register now on the Church Center app or our website homepage. Do it now. If you missed anything I said, you can check it out in your bulletin. You can find that if you're online with us on our website or app homepage. And if you're in person with us, you can pick one up on your way out if you don't have one already. If you're looking to give this morning, you can find receptacles by each exit to the worship center if you're in-house with us where you can drop off cash or check donations. If you'd like to give online, you can do so on the church website or the app under the Give tab. We appreciate any and all gifts that you are able to give and you feel the Lord is calling you to give to Emmanuel Church. Well, thanks for listening, Emmanuel. And now let's hear from our multicultural ministry team about an exciting upcoming opportunity. 
。我们在天上的父，愿人都尊你的名为圣。나라가임하시오며뜻이하늘에서이루어진것같이땅에서도이루어지이다。Pardonne nous nos offenses, comme nous pardonnons aussi à ceux qui nous ont offensés. No nos dejes caer en la tentación y líbranos de nuestro mal. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Now and forever. Amen. According to U.S. Census, 21.6 percent of people in the U.S. speak a language other than English at home. Did you know Emmanuel Church represents more than 30 countries? How about you? Do you speak more than one language? How did you learn other languages? Did you, your parents, or your spouse immigrate from another country? Did you study or work abroad? Are you fascinated that all ethnicities reflect the image of God? If you say yes to any of these questions, you and your family are invited to our first bilingual roundtable on Sunday, May 7th, after the second service at the church cafe. We will celebrate together the diversity God created among us and share our experiences and memories of being multilingual and appreciate one another and our cultures. A simple and delicious lunch and a childcare up to kindergartners will be available. You can sign up by May 4th through our church app and website. If you can, you can contribute five dollar per person for lunch. We are excited to hear your unique stories. Okay,、yeah. <laughs> for the kingdom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Hey, good morning, church. Welcome. We are so glad you are here. Did everybody have a good post Easter week? Great. Yeah. Come on. Awesome. Well, a couple things I want to draw your attention to today. Like Josh said during announcements, we had 30 baptisms last week, and we praise God for that. And that is why the lantern is on. For those of you who don't know, that lantern is on whenever somebody has given their life to Christ through the influence of Emmanuel. So if you come to church on a Sunday morning, you see the lantern on. Just know that somebody has chosen Jesus that week, thanks to this church. So we praise God for that. Also, some of you saw our table on the way in. This is Name Tag Sunday. How long has it been since we've had a Name Tag Sunday? We figured let's let's do something a little different. You know, sometimes you get into that awkward moment where you've seen somebody at church for like months and you don't know their name or you forgot their name. So do your research today. Right, write down like, okay, that person's name's Jim. That's Bob. Like, so you can try to lock it in for next time. But we're glad that you guys participated in that, and we're just glad that you are here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor Jake. I'm the youth director here at Emmanuel, and I am so blessed and honored to be able to bring the word to you this morning. We've been in a series now for a good bit called the Hard Sayings. Of Jesus, and this is coming from the Sermon on the Mount. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount since the beginning of the year, and if you know the Sermon on the Mount, you know there is just so much that we can gain and learn from Jesus' words in this part of Scripture. So we're going to be in it for a while because there's just a lot that we can take away.、Uh, today, specifically, we're going to be in Matthew chapter five, verses thirty-three to thirty-seven, and today we're going to talk about the power of words. The power of words. So before、uh, I jump into any of that, I would just love the opportunity to pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this blessed Sunday morning. Even though we celebrated Easter last week, we know that there's not just one day to celebrate Easter, but a lifetime where we get to celebrate your work of the cross in our lives and how it's changed our lives. So, Lord, today I pray that you would speak through your word. You would speak through me. You would speak through the worship, as I'm sure you already have to many in this room. God, that you would just open us up so that we could hear what you have for us today. No matter where we're listening, no matter what we've got going on in our life right now, God, there is a word for every single person here, and I am confident in that because I am confident in you. So, Lord, speak. We are listening. It is in your name we pray. Amen. So in Matthew chapter five, Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says this: "Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, 'Do not break your oath, but fulfill it to the Lord the vows you have made.' But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. 
And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, this part of the Sermon on the Mount is all about words, specifically oaths, which basically means a promise. Saying that you will do something is an oath. It's a promise, right? And the Sermon on the Mount is filled with difficult things for us to hear. It's basically just a big call to repentance. Jesus calling out some of the ways that we need to change, that we need to do different. And he's speaking specifically to the people of this time. But it's amazing that we can hear his words and go, well, it still applies to me today. And the thing about this portion in specific was he was speaking to all the people there because they had an issue with words. Meaning they had an issue with saying what they meant. An oath, a promise, means you, you promise you're going to do something. You say you're going to do something, and you're going to back it up. But the people at this time were having difficulty with that. They would say things. They would swear oaths to, to themselves, to God, to, to all these different things, but they wouldn't back up their words. So they're swearing all these oaths. They're saying all these things, but their words are empty. They're meaningless. And Jesus is calling this out directly, saying, hey, don't swear an oath at all. Because if you're not going to back it up, there's no point in saying the words in the first place. So he's telling them and telling us through this, mean what you say. Say only things that you're going to back up. Say only things that you're going to mean. Because the people at this time, their words had become so empty that they had to swear themselves to certain things to give some sort of validity to what they were saying. You know, have you, I'm sure none of you have ever used this phrase, but some people you said, I swear to God. Oh, we don't say that anymore. But they're saying that because they're, they're words that you need to know that they mean what they say. I swear to this or I swear to that or we fill in the blank with all these other things. And the people at this time, they were filling in the blanks with so many things. I swear to this, I swear to that. But you shouldn't have to swear to anything. Your words should hold truth. Your words should hold meaning. If I say something, I mean it. If I hear something, I should trust that the person that said it means it. But Jesus is saying to them and saying to us that that's not happening all the time. That we're using our words for less than what they're worth. That we need to mean what we say. Another version of, of verse 37 says, Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Think about that again. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. You want to make your yes and your no full of meaning, full of worth. If you say yes to anything, then your yes really doesn't mean anything. Your ability to say no gives meaning to your yes. I'm, I'm coming out of a season in my life where I learned I just can't say yes to everything. Right? We have a desire sometimes to want to say yes to everything, to want to be the person that steps in at the right time and can do everything and help everyone, but that's just not the case. So I've had to learn the simplest yet most meaningful word of no, I can't do that. But that gives so much more meaning to when I say yes, I would love to do that. Our words need meaning. Our words need to be exactly what we say, we have to say what we mean. This is the issue of the people back then, and this is the issue that we have right now. Because our words have power. And Jesus understands the power of words. And that's exactly why he makes this a part of the Sermon on the Mount, is that Jesus knows the power that words have. So I want to ask you a couple questions today as I get the chance to share with you. A couple questions that I want you to think about, to ponder today as, as we are here and beyond. And the first question is, do your words hold meaning? Do you mean what you say? Jesus is warning against people who are making all these incredible oaths and promises but have no plans on fulfilling them. So do you ever say things just to say things? Or do your words have intention and purpose? The first thing we must do is acknowledge that words have power and things that have power deserve respect. They deserve intention and direction. You see, words can be kind of like weapons. I find them comparable specifically to missiles. Did you know the United States has one of the largest arsenal of nuclear weapons? 
the U.S. arsenal contains about 5,400 nuclear weapons, 1,744 of which are deployed and ready to be delivered. Think about that, ready to be delivered. They are at the ready. And of those, about half of them are prepared by what's called a hair trigger alert. It is as it sounds. A hair trigger alert basically means it's really ready to go. At the push of a button and within 10 minutes, thanks to this hair trigger alert, missiles can be off, headed towards something, ready for mass destruction. Less than 10 minutes, a nuclear missile can be fired off. Now, because we have missiles at the ready, because that's what our defense system is, people kind of have to take our country seriously because they know we're going to back up what we say and what we do. As a matter of fact, this idea of this arsenal and specifically this hair trigger alert that I just talked about dates all the way back to the Cold War because at the time, people and just countries were living in such secrecy and collusion that you never really knew what was going to happen. So you always had to be at the ready. So the United States developed this hair trigger alert because if someone were to take the first step and throw the first punch at us, we were going to say, well, we got something for you too. And they would create what they call mutually assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction. Assured destruction. If you throw the punch at us, we're going to throw it right back at you. If you're taking me down, I'm going down too. And because of that, and because of our history, people look at our country and they take us seriously. They understand that what we say we will do, we can very well go and do it. So people have to take us seriously. Our words, our actions have meaning. And think of that about your life. Because when we have so many of these weapons ready to fire, people look at us and they just know that we're being real, we're being honest. When other people listen to you talk, when other people are in relationship with you, in conversation with you, are they looking at you and taking your words for exactly as you say them? Are they taking your words seriously? Do they believe the meaning that your words have? Or are they saying, oh, they're, they're just saying that. You know, they don't really mean what they say. Their words are empty. I've heard them say this before. I've heard them say they're going to do this before. And they just don't do it. What kind of person are you? What kind of meaning do your words hold? Can people take you and your words seriously? We have to take a look at ourselves and go, do we speak in a manner that is befitting to ourselves? Do we give true meaning with what we say? Do we say what we mean? Do we mean what we say? And unfortunately, a group that has the biggest problem with backing up what they say is Christians. Christians have a big difficulty with saying what they mean and saying and not meaning what they say. We are very good with our words, but we're not always good with our actions. Recently, a couple of us on staff uh, had this little book group, and we read this book called Radical. And it's all about being radically abandoned to Jesus. And it's made me look at my faith and my life a lot differently, and it made me take my actions a lot more seriously. I only want to do things that I know are worth doing. I only want to say things that I know are worth saying. Last year, I, I just had this thought, and, and it's really changed the way I've said things a lot, because we talk about other people a lot. It's probably what we talk about most. We're talking about somebody else, a family member, a friend, somebody we met, the weird person at the grocery store. We just have to tell the story of why they were so weird. But I thought about how often I was talking about people when they weren't in the room. And I had to ask myself the question, would I say that about that person if they were in the room? Because if I wouldn't, why am I saying it? If I'm talking about this person in a way that if they were standing right there, I wouldn't be talking about that person, then why am I saying those things? And for the last year or so, every time I've gone to say something about someone, I've paused. And I've said, if they were right here, would you be saying the same thing? And to be honest, I haven't said the thing a lot of times because I've realized that, that not every thought is worth a word, that not everything I think, that not everything I feel is worth becoming a word, is worth becoming an action. So I've had to take a real account of my life and the words that I say about other people specifically because, again, I want my words to mean something. I, I don't want people to look at me and go, man, Jake, he, he talks a lot about other people. 
He has a lot of opinions about other people. I don't want other people to hear, wait, he, he was talking about me? He said that to you about, that hurts, right? We've all been there. where We've heard what somebody said about us but not to us. That hurts. And, and this is a problem in the, in the church. This is a problem outside of the church. But Christians, we, we talk a big game. And our Bible has a lot of things to say about how we ought to live. But how much are we backing that up with our actions? How much are we actually living out the Christian lifestyle that we are told to live out? I think some of us take Jesus' commands as suggestions. If Jesus says it, we do it. There's no question mark. There's no font that says, well, he didn't really mean this, so it's only if you want to do it. A command is a command, and a command from our Savior is a command worth following. So mean what you say, say what you mean, and the only way you can do that is through your actions. You have to act upon what you say. You have to act upon what your faith and what our word and what our Savior says we ought to do and who we ought to be. 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Our love is shown through our actions. You can say you love someone, but how are you showing it? Love is not words. Love is action. Truth is not words. Truth is action. And we have such important things to share, church. Our words must back it up. Our actions must back it up. Jesus is really making it clear that he wants your words to mean something. When you speak, he wants people to be listening because he wants people around you to know if they have something to say, they have something to say. I don't want my words just to be simply fired off without thinking. I don't want my words to just go out to people and not have any meaning or truth to them. And honestly, when you take this seriously in your life, you find you have a lot less words to say. There's so many times where, where I've gone to say something and go, you know what, that really doesn't need to be said right now. Because our, our minds aren't perfect, our thoughts aren't perfect. Now, I work with teens, and, and right now, not just right now, I'm working on this concept of a filter. Is anybody familiar with that? Because they're not. I can tell you they're not. They are not very familiar with the idea of a filter. You see, like a filter, when you have like a water filter, the water goes through, all the bad stuff stays out, and the good, clean water comes through. And our minds, I hope, all have that same thing, where we have all these thoughts, all these ideas, but you need a filter so that some of the stuff, hey, just stays with you. We don't need to know it all. I don't need to know it all. Some of it just stays between you and God. Sometimes you have a thought and you just have to pause and pray. Be like, God, I don't know where that came from, but can it never happen again? <laughs> we, need to, we need to work on that. We need to work on saying the things that we mean and taking account for our words. So that's the first charge I have for you today. The first question is, do your words have meaning? Do you mean what you say? And I want you to really think about that today as you go about your day, as you go to have conversations, as you go to post on social media, whatever it is, do your words have meaning? Do people listen to them because they know that if you have something to say, that it's going to mean something? But the thing about that is your words can have meaning, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are good. I can say things with meaning, but what if my words with meaning are actually bad? Like, like the, the example of the missiles. Those missiles have meaning, but it's not good meaning. If you were to see a missile fired off, you would know what it means, and it's not good. Some of us, we mean what we say, but that's not necessarily a good thing. We fire off our words with the same intention of missiles, that we want them to go and make impact, but not in a good way. Some of us have used our words for hurt time and time again to the point where now we're just ready to fire off whenever somebody comes and is ready to have conversation with us. Some of us are at a stance where we just think someone's going to say something negative to us, so we're just ready to fire back whenever it means necessary. We're kind of like our own military. We, we have that missile ready to fire off, and if it means mutually assured destruction with another person, then that's something we're just going to deal with. Because sometimes that's exactly what words turn into. They are mutually assured destruction. If you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you right back. 
If you have something to say to me, I'm going to think of something more clever, more hurtful, and I'm going to fire it right back. You see, when, when I was growing up, I grew up with friends that, you know, just love to do this. You know, guys have this kind of back and forth where we think it's funny, and sometimes it is, and sometimes, man, those words, they land and they hurt. And God has gifted me with a pretty creative mind, so I got pretty good at being the one that could really fire back. And people eventually knew, if I say something to Jake, he's going to say something that, like, you know, there's a line you're not supposed to cross. I had very much fun just running right past that line. And so people knew, all right, I, I, you know, if I try to make a, a joke about him, he, he's, he's going to be ready. He's going to have that missile ready to fire. And to be honest, I still struggle with these thoughts, and my friends still love to joke and love to say things. And like I said, there's so many times where the beautiful creative mind that the Lord has gifted me and everybody with has come up with some not beautiful and not good things. And I've really had to pause and think about the impact that those words would make if I fired them off, if I let them go. Because the thing is, if I'm a person of integrity, if we want to be people of integrity, right? We want to be people of meaning and intent and purpose. That means that sometimes people know you mean what you say. And therefore, if you say something that's not good, they know you mean that too. Think about the, the two sides that we have here. You can either have meaning in your words and then run the risk of, well, if I say something not good, they're, they're going to know that I mean it. Or we can just say whatever and people will never take it seriously, but then they're never going to be able to take us seriously. They're never going to be able to take our words for truth. And, and as Christians, we have a lot of great things to share. We have the most important thing to share. So are your words getting in the way of your ability to share the gospel? Are your words getting in the way of your ability to represent Christ? Are your words intended to hurt? Now, James has a lot to say about word. In the book of James, Chapter 3, starting at verse 3, this is what he has to say. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison." Now, when you read the words of Jesus and you read the words of James, you can kind of tell that they're brothers, right? James and Jesus are, are brothers, and it's because they mean what they say, both of them, and they both have powerful things to say about our words. James says a small bit in the mouth of a horse can control the entire animal. Something so small, so simple, can change the direction of an entire animal. And like that in a ship, you have a rudder on a ship, it is something so small in comparison to the entire ship, but it only takes something so small, so simple, to change the direction of the entire ship. What is he trying to say here? He's saying our words, they seem so small. They seem so simple. Sometimes we speak without thinking, but they can change the entire direction of yourself or someone else. Something so small, something so simple, has so much power in our lives and in the lives of others. He even goes so far to say that no human being can tame the tongue. Our sinful nature has such a control over the words that we speak that he is saying it is impossible to actually tame our tongue and to be intentional with our words. This is strong words from James. And as I was reading this, I was just thinking, and maybe you relate, some of the worst things I've ever done have been done with my words. Some of the worst things in my life have been done with my words. Some words that I wish I could take back, but I never, ever will be able to. 
So our words, we need to be intentional. We need to mean what we say, but we need that to be a good thing as well. Because some of us are really good at meaning what we say, and that means we're really good at hurting people with our words. We need to take account of everything I say. Some of us are to the point where we actually enjoy the fact that we can push people's buttons, that we can get a reaction based off what we say. There was a season in my life, like I said, where I did exactly that. But then I started watching hockey, and I learned that instigation is a penalty in hockey, and it's not good in life either. Instigating just leads to trouble, and it's no good for me or for anybody else. So when you think about your words and the meaning they have, the first question you ask is, are my words meaningful? Do they have meaning? Do people take them seriously? The next question is, is that a good thing? Do your words hurt or do your words heal? Because James goes on to continue in that chapter and says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He's backing up exactly what Jesus is saying. We want to speak life. We want good things to come from our mouth and the words that we say. Because if we get to a point where we've got bad stuff over here and good stuff over here, which are people going to take seriously? We just sang songs of praise to our Father. We sat here and we worshiped loud and proud and we let our cry of worship be heard by everybody in here. And some of us will leave the room and our words that were intended for worship mere minutes ago will then be changed and be meant for hurt and harm to people around us. How is that possible? James is questioning that very same thing. How is it possible that the best words that we could ever speak of worship can also come from the same place that tears down people day in, day out, time and time again? There's power in our words. It makes me think of Adam. Do you know what Adam's first responsibility on earth was? It was to name animals. God put him on the earth with all the animals, and his first job was to name them. As he saw an animal, he spoke a name over it, and that's exactly what it was. Do you know that you have the same power in your words, that you can look someone and speak a name over someone, and they will identify with whatever you just said to them? Think about the power that is in that, that you can look at someone, you can call them no good, you can call them lonely, stupid, crazy, whatever you can think of. And as soon as you say that, they're going to identify with whatever you say. The same power that Adam had when he would look at a dog and call it a dog or when he would look at a bird and call it a bird, you have that same power when you look at someone and call them blank. So what are you calling the people in your life? Because you can call them evil or you can call them free from evil thanks to the Savior. You can call them Seen, heard, understood. You can call them loved. There are power in our words. There are power in the things that we say to people. Are you using the power of your words to speak life? Or are they simply an extension of your free will? Are you just saying what you want, when you want, because you want to? I wish there was a warning label that came with our mouths, that came with the words that we speak. I wish we had to read and accept terms and conditions before we used our mouths because our words are as good as a gun. You can fire that trigger easy and as soon as it's gone, you can't take it back. Do we understand the power that our words have? Do we understand that there are true harm and hurt behind our words, but there's also true life that we can be speaking into people? We have the opportunity to speak truth and life into everybody that we come into contact with? Do we use this power for good? Do we look at people and tell them that they are loved by the Father, saved by a Savior, that they can be new because of our God? 
I ask you, don't be overwhelmed by the negative effects of your word, but be encouraged by the positive effects that they can have. That's two different perspectives, right? You can look at the negative side and go, well, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Or you can look at the positive side and say, I only hope to say the things that will help other people, that will lift people up. I think this topic of words is one of the most simple topics that we probably don't think about or talk about enough because there's such power in something so simple. My request of you today is to choose to speak life and choose to mean it. Use your words for good. Use the words that God has given you for power. We don't think about the blessing of communication very much. It is a blessing that we can communicate in the way that we do, that we can so clearly communicate to one another. But with every blessing comes a responsibility that we should use it for good. And then we not only should use it for good, that we should use it for God's glory. Earlier, we, we sang a new song. Uh, it's called Another Glimpse. And it's a song that, that has become just one of my favorites recently. So every year, I, I've gotten in the habit of going to this conference called Passion Conference. It's a young adult conference, usually held in Atlanta. They move around sometimes. And, and I've gone three times now. And for me, it's been a place of personal revival every time I show up. When you're in a building with thousands of other young adults just worshiping the Lord and hearing the word, you can't help but feel fired up for the Lord in those moments. And, and this year, uh, one of the members of, of Passion, this guy named Sean Kern, who is a, a worship artist, somebody I, I just am in love with. I think he's amazing. His words, his, his worship songs are just incredible. He sang the song Another Glimpse, and he explained that this song comes directly from Revelation 4 which is kind of a, a sneak peek at the throne room. I'm going to read a little bit of Revelation 4 and see if some of the words I say kind of match up with some of what we were singing earlier. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne was what looked like the sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the, around the throne were four living creatures. And day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. There are four angels that constantly circle the throne and all they say is holy, holy, holy. For all of eternity, they will be there. And the idea behind this song is that maybe repetition isn't redundancy. Meaning that maybe with every lap around the throne, they see a new part of God that just makes them cry out, holy, holy, holy. Every chance they get to see God, something new is revealed to them. And they cannot help but cry out in worship. Their words for all of eternity will be used for worship. That is an opportunity that they have. So the last question I want you to think about, and if this is the only question you think about today, I think it's one worth thinking about. Are your life's words and actions used to glorify God? Is everything that you have meant to glorify and lift up God? Specifically, we're talking about our words today. Do your words glorify God, this song that we sing and we're going to get to sing again is all about these angels in heaven and that they have this opportunity forever and ever to worship and glorify God. And every chance they get, all they can say is holy, holy, holy. It's the only word they can think to define God because holy means set apart, means different means unlike anything else. And our God is set apart, is different, is unlike anything else. And if our God is holy, we should reflect our God. We should be different. We should be set apart. What if we chose only to speak life out into the world? Would we as Christians be seen different? Would we change the world? Would we change our community? Would we change the people that we're in relationship with? Because the world loves to talk. The world loves to have a voice. And in today's time, people have a voice and can scream and shout 
whatever they want, wherever they want, and they love to do it. But what if we took account of our words and said, I am only going to speak the things that I mean, and I am only going to speak the things that bring life to a hurting world. Because that is our responsibility as Christians. That is the plea of Jesus. That is the plea of James. Don't just speak empty words. Don't just speak what you feel like saying. It can be so easy in a moment to give in to the words that we just want to say because someone's sent something our way and we want to just fire back. But church, I'm begging you, our words are worth so much. These angels in heaven, they know the worth and the power of their words and they choose every moment to worship. So what if you chose every word to be worship? That doesn't just mean you sing worship songs wherever you go. It means your words speak life and truth to the people around you. I truly think that if we were to embody the gospel with everything that we had, our world would look different. So today I'm asking you to start with your words. Make them mean something and make them mean something good. So we're going to sing this song one more time. And as we sing, I want you to think about a couple things. First, think about that throne room. I mean, when you read all of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, it's a crazy scene. But in that throne room is constant worship. And then think about what your life would look like if it was constant worship. If your words were only used to glorify the God that has saved you, that has given all for you. That is a God worthy of not just our words, but our entire life. So church, I'm gonna pray for us. And then I pray you sing in a manner that befits our God. Because the opportunity to worship is a great one. And let me give you one more thought. The place we are now is the only place that we will ever worship from a human perspective for eternity. Some of you are worshiping through pain this morning. And I say, blessed are you. Because when we get to heaven, we will be worshiping from a place of glory. And right now, your worship and your words mean so much because we are here and not there. And we are meant to reflect God here. And one day, we will get to reflect God there. And that's an amazing opportunity. Let me pray for us. God, you have given us so many gifts. You've given us so much. Last week, we celebrated the ultimate gift, the cross. Oh, what a gift it is. Jesus, that you went to the cross, that you stayed on the cross, that you took the pain and the anguish that we all deserve. You took it all for us. And whenever an action like that happens, we have to ask, what is our response? And last week, God, so many people responded by saying, my response is to give it all before you. We had people baptized so many times to show the world that they were giving everything to you. And this week, God, we hone in on a specific part of our life that we need to give to you, our words. Our words are so simple. It can be an area that we are not careful about. But God, your word makes it clear that our words have power. Our words have power, and we want that to be a good thing. So God, as we finish this service in worship, I pray we worship in a manner befitting to you, that we wouldn't care about the people around us, that we would just worship such meaningful words, that we would think about your throne and the angels around it that just worship for all of eternity. They're worshiping right now, and they will forevermore. And God, I pray that we think about our lives and our words today and that we would make it worship to you, that people would know who we reflect based off the words we speak and the actions that we show. All I can say, God, is thank you. Thank you. It is in your name we pray. Amen.
God, repeating this song is so powerful. God, we didn't want to sing it once today. We wanted to sing it so many times. God, it is so important for us to recognize how holy you are, God, how our words are a reflection of you when we choose to bear your name, God. We don't want to do you wrong. It's not just about us anymore. God, we also want to thank you that you are a God who is so much greater than our iniquity, the fact that we can mess this up, and yet it doesn't matter because you are still holy. God, we can say the wrong things, we can do the wrong things, and you are still holy. God, it's not revolving around what we're doing, but rather you invite us into this moment, into this life to live and reflect you. And you know we're going to mess up. You know we're not going to be perfect, God. But you still want us to be a part of it because that's why you created us, to be in relationship with you. And God, we can't build that relationship without words, God. We can't build it without talking to you. We can't build your kingdom here on earth if we don't talk to others about you, God. And we recognize these things. So as we sing holy, holy, holy God, we pray that that's a reminder, a praise to you and a reminder to us of the work that still has yet to be done. God, you don't ask us to do work simply to do work, but rather you ask us to obey. God, you ask us to say yes to you and all the things that you're calling us to do. Allow us to lean into you and allow you to do the work. God, life isn't easy, but you know that. You designed that. And you made it beautiful. So God, you are holy. You are awesome. You are powerful. You are true. We love you, and we thank you again and again and again, and all God's children say, amen. And God bless. Thanks for worshiping with us. Hey, be a light to someone else this week.